Dan has two examples from the analytic area, once where we got it exactly right and once where we got it exactly wrong. So he'll tell you about that too. Uh, and then we very, try very, very hard to make these documents available to the public on the Crest system here at uh, the National Archives and on our public website. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Here's a representative example of some of the release events that we've held across the country. We did one on the life of Richard Helms at Georgetown University. Uh, we had uh, Henry Kissinger and Brent Scowcroft uh, speak at that event for us. Uh, we had one at uh, Harvard on the Warsaw Pact, and uh, noted historian Mark Kramer uh, participated in that. Polish martial law was fascinating. We had that in the auditorium at CIA headquarters. Zbigniew Brzezinski uh, was one of the guest speakers there. I sat next to the Polish ambassador. Uh, he was quite animated. Uh, at the end of that session, uh, there was a Polish TV anchor in the audience who I, I guess received permission from public affairs, at least I hope received permission from public affairs, <laughs> to go to the front of the auditorium beneath the CIA and, and American flags. And she was speaking in Polish. And I asked uh, one of the Poles sitting next to me, what was she saying? And he started laughing. He said, she's saying very quietly, speaking to you tonight from inside CIA headquarters in Washington, D.C. <laughs> he said, that will be all over the Polish news tonight. <laughs> we released a huge tranche of Air America records down at the University of Texas uh, and, and, and some others. The Wizards of Langley, former Secretary of Defense, William Perry, came to speak at. So. These events have proved enormously popular. They've created a records management product for us, uh, and uh, it really has turned out uh, to be wonderful. So I think I'm going to stop right here and ask Dan to come up. He's going to give you some examples of uh, our releases in analysis, in covert action, in human intelligence collection, and in science and technology. And then uh, I believe he's got a couple of videos embedded, and we'll uh, take questions after that. So Dan, why don't you come on up? All right, next slide, please. And we could skip this one. But uh, we're going to start with human intelligence. There's different kinds of uh, things. And so we're going to go look at material that we have uh, released publicly previously. So if you can start up the first uh, video, please. Next slide. These are remarks from Michael Sulik, the former director of the National <laughs> Clandestine Service during the uh, Polish martial law event. Hello, I'm Michael Sewell, director of the National Clandestine Service. Over the last several decades, the CIA has played a prominent role in our national defense by managing potentially hazardous situations before they occur. The collection of intelligence from foreign nationals is vital to these efforts. There are a few greater examples of this than the story you are about to hear. Colonel Richard Kuklinski was one of our most important assets in the Cold War. From 1972 to 1981, he provided thousands of invaluable documents on the Warsaw Pact that gave us a much better understanding of the military threat to NATO. Particularly in the tense 18-month period leading up to the declaration of martial law in Poland in December 1981, Kuklinski proved time and time again the value of human intelligence. He attended meetings of the Polish government leadership as they debated the imposition of martial law as an option to prevent their Soviet masters' threat of a full-scale invasion to quell rising unrest in the country. He passed details of these meetings to the CIA in an extremely risky counterintelligence environment where our officers in Warsaw were under heavy surveillance, and his intelligence was immediately passed to President Reagan. At one meeting of the leadership attended by Kuklinski, Polish intelligence claimed there was a spy in their midst. Kuklinski alerted the CIA that the net was closing in on him, and we exfiltrated him with his family in early November. The documents which Kuklinski provided the United States, and which have now been declassified, reveal a Polish government apparatus nearly paralyzed by the spontaneous eruption of solidarity, the collapse of its own morale, and the continued pressure from Soviet leaders to restore order. Kuklinski's documentary and eyewitness accounts vividly portray how Polish military leader Wojciech Januszewski vacillated but finally concluded he needed to act. Kuklinski's information demonstrated that Warsaw was increasingly ready to implement martial law, but because of his exfiltration, he 
but could not tell us that the final decision had been made to implement the plan. After the fall of communism in Poland, Kuklinski's case became a cause celeb. He always dreamed of returning to a free Poland, but even after the fall of communism, he was still a convicted spy. His sentence of death had been commuted to a jail sentence of 25 years, and he would have been arrested if he had returned. Some fervent anti-communists in Poland claimed that a politician's stance on Kuklinski was a gauge of his or her stance on communism. Some even attacked President Lech Wałęsa as pro-communist because he would not immediately drop the charges against Kuklinski. Kuklinski himself had always maintained that he would not accept a pardon because he had committed no crime. On the other side, some voices, especially in the Polish military, strongly opposed dropping the charges against Kuklinski and maintained that, despite his fight against Soviet communism, Kuklinski had violated his military oath and the information he passed would have resulted in the deaths of Polish soldiers in the event of armed conflict in Europe. The debate was at a fever pitch in the early 1990s and was crystallized in a best-selling, controversial book published in Poland that was entitled Kuklinski, Hero or Traitor? Some in Poland discreetly hinted that Kuklinski would eventually be exonerated. They were right. The legal case against him was finally dropped and he returned on a trip to Poland in 1998. When Poland was admitted to NATO, the Polish Embassy in Washington, D.C. held a ceremony to celebrate the entry and honored a number of people who contributed to the outcome, which the post-communist Polish government viewed as its major foreign policy goal at the time. Kuklinski was among those honored, and the Polish government official acknowledgement of his contribution was at long last the symbol of his exoneration. Okay. Can we go to the next slide, please? And as the, as the remarks say, this is a, a dangerous path. Uh, I think the video covers this well, and we're a little behind on time, so I'd like to go to the next, uh, skip the next slide and go to yeah, go again. All right, the next one will be talking about analysis. This is a study of information. It's been likened to taking handfuls out of different jigsaw puzzles, throwing them into a box, mixing them up, and then trying to figure out what the pictures on the puzzle should have been. Uh, uh, so you never have all the pieces, and you have several possible stories that these things could be. And so this is kind of the essence of intelligence analysis. So go to the next slide, please. And we're going to talk about Korea. Uh, and the big policy question in 1950 is, are the uh, North Koreans going to invade? Because, or not the North Koreans, but is China going to come into the war? Uh, for those who haven't followed the Korean War, in June 1950, North Korea invades the South. Very quickly, the South Koreans fall back to the Pusan perimeter with the very south corner of the country. Uh, General MacArthur uh, launches a massive invasion at Incheon in September, and in a matter of weeks has rolled the uh, uh, North Koreans back to the Chinese border at the Yalu River, which is down on the right. So go to the next slide, please. So one of the first national intelligence estimates from the Central Intelligence Agency uh, basically weighs all the evidence, and there's evidence on both sides and concludes Nope, they're not going to. They're not going to come in. And go to the next slide. On one November, it turned out that wasn't right. Uh, the the uh, Chinese came across the Yalu River in force. A uh, picture on the left is part of the uh, heroic marine defense at the Chosin Reservoir. Uh, you can see a, a really great story on this at the Marine Corps Museum in Quantico. Uh, and the one on the right, you see them here coming back across the 38th parallel. And from then to the end of the war, it's basically a stalemate. So the next one I'll talk about is one that went a little better. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is the Prague Spring. So uh, a fellow by the name of Alexander Dubček uh, takes over in Czechoslovakia and begins to, on the lower, uh, on your lower left here, he's brewing up a delicious stew of reforms. And everybody's very happy about it. Uh, Brezhnev perhaps somewhat less so. And they, they, again, there's noise being made that you know they, there was the uh, 
they rolled over Hungary in 1956, and was this going to happen again? And uh, so that you know, are they are they coming? And the, on the upper right, it's uh, uh, Helms uh, briefing uh, President Johnson. Johnson sitting in the chair under the pictures. So again, here's our memorandum. Next slide, please. And uh, down at the bottom line here, it says that in two weeks' time, they're, they've completed all the preparations necessary for an invasion. So it looks like they're going to go. The hard part is you never really know what they're thinking. You, you know, it depends on how well your sources are connected. So go to the next slide, please. And sure enough, uh, they come in. All the pictures you see here are used with permission in our uh, publications because it really helps to go along with the documents to provide other historical material and other speakers to provide context so that people can put this together. Many of these events are extremely complementary with other work going on in presidential libraries. So this one we did a, uh, with a release at the, at the uh, Truman Library uh, commemorating the uh, anniversary of the uh, Korean War. A little bit on science and technology, uh, one of the other parts of CI. Next slide, please. Uh, it's in from, the two stories I'm going to talk about are uh, remote sensing stories, but these are people that make gadgets and things. Uh, and the, Next slide, please. So threats of the time that nobody had real good answers to was uh, the Soviet Union suddenly had the atomic bomb, or the hydrogen bomb, uh, suddenly had Sputnik. Suddenly, there's a, is there really a bomber gap? Because you're there at the May Day Parade and seeing all these massive quantities of new bombers. And then there was worry about a missile gap. And at the time, the Soviet Union's a closed society. You can't really go send people around and look. There isn't much of a capability to collect uh, definitive intelligence on this. So next slide, please. So part of the answer, and there were many answers uh, that span many agencies, uh, was uh, some reconnaissance uh, aircraft. And the uh, first one put together was the U-2, uh, which was put into operation very quickly. It basically took an existing uh, fighter frame and basically put very long wings on it, and it became a very viable uh, intelligence platform. And interestingly enough, the U-2s still fly. Uh, the other one is the uh, A-12, uh, more popularly known as the SR-71, uh, which uh, went into operation in uh, 1963. But uh, it was a very expensive program to run, and so in the 80s, the, uh, the A-12 program was canceled. The key thing about these programs are, though, they were instrumental in finding out that what the Soviets had done on May Day was take a small number of bombers and fly them in a big loop. And so they were going down over the horizon, coming around and going back over again. So the defense attache is sitting here clicking the button every time a fight, uh, one of these bombers comes by. And it turns out it was largely a, sh a charade. Uh, and they, this also became key. The picture in the middle is one of the famous pictures from the Cuban Missile Crisis. So uh, next slide, please. And then they went to satellite systems. Uh, this is a uh, completely audacious undertaking for the late 50s uh, because at the time, the U.S. hadn't really launched any satellites. And we're going to go build a big imaging satellite. And uh, one of the brains behind this was um, oh, the guy from Polaroid. His name escapes me. But um, Ed, Ed, Edward Land. And uh, this thing went live in uh, 1960, about the same time that Gary Powers was shot down over the Soviet Union. And so this became the next generation. Uh, the subsequent to this time, the National Reconnaissance Office was created, and mo all, the, all the technology work and platform work relating to these systems is now run by the National Reconnaissance Office. Next slide, please. The last piece is a covert action. This is basically taking some kind of action not associated with the U.S. government. And I'm going to tell a little story about uh, civil air transport, also known as Air America. This was set up by Claire Chenault. Uh, he was a World War II uh, commander of some fame running the Flying Tigers in uh, Asia. Uh, he set up his own airline after the war, commercial airline. Uh, with the fall of the uh, Chinese mainland in 1949, uh, his business became severely impaired. And at the same time that there was a monumental intelligence interest in knowing what was going on in, in Asia, 
And so through some mechanism, CIA acquired the, an interest in, an owning interest in the airline uh, covertly. And among many stories that can be told here, uh, we'll go to the uh, Lima Site 85, which will be the next slide. This is a project called Project Heavy Green. Uh, during the Vietnam War, they were, they were wanting to bomb uh, targets in downtown Hanoi. The problem was directing uh, bombers into the site. They didn't want to use the B-52 bombers. They wanted to use some smaller ones. And so there was a desire to set up a, a radar site in northern, northeastern Laos to guide, uh, guide pilots into Hanoi. And so they set this thing up on top of a mountain range, and it's 120 miles from downtown Hanoi. Uh, Air America is used to get the materials in, get the people in, get the people out, all that kind of stuff. So there's a video here, and I don't think I'm going to have time to show it. But uh, show, show a minute of it. Okay, we can start the video. The video is going to show you. It's got a. Sound. It's kind of dark, but it gets lighter. Yeah. In the summer of 1967, the United States Air Force began Project Heavy Green. Heavy Green was a top secret program to place a TSQ-81 special radar system atop a mountain in northeastern Laos. The mountain called Pati, with the designation Lima Site 85, was located only 125 miles from downtown Hanoi. Lima Site 85 was also about 20 miles south of the North Vietnamese border. So it was in a perfect location to guide F-105 fighter bombers to targets in North Vietnam and in Laos. This video shows the early construction of Site 85. As you see here, alongside the mountain, the building of the trailers, and to the right, you can see the Lima site that was at the lower part of Pati, where the CIA operations area was at. As you look at this video at this point, you are looking towards North Vietnam to the north and east, swinging across the western face of Pupati at an elevation of about 5,400 feet. That's probably good. Okay. And again, as the video pans out, looking further towards the east, you see the beautiful valleys and the remoteness of this part of northeastern Laos. And next slide. And the upshot of this is it was of limited success for its intended purpose. Um, the North Vietnamese rather quickly discovered the site. Um, and uh, first off, they took a shot at uh, taking down the, the site by sending in a couple of biplanes uh, to shoot up the place. Uh, they were intercepted by an Air America a helicopter that just happened to be coming in. And some guy on the helicopter basically grabbed a rifle. These are unarmed, un unarmored helicopters. And basically uh, shot at this thing with a machine gun out the side door of the plane uh, and actually shot one of them down. And it's the, <laughs> it's the, it's the first uh, helicopter shooting down of an airplane that anybody uh, seems to know of. Uh, unfortunately, the North Vietnamese come back uh, rather resolutely, and they have sappers uh, climb the mountain. Uh, they do a 2,000-foot uh, climb of that cliff and launch a surprise attack. Uh, this ends up causing the largest loss of life in the Air Force uh, in the Vietnam conflict. Uh, Air America came in with uh, uh, a pilot, Ken Wood, and a, a flight mechanic, Rusty Irons, and rescued four people uh, during the attack. Uh, one of those people was uh, Chief Master Sergeant Richard Etchberger. And what he did is he had a gun inside the door after he was picked up, and he was trying to hold off the uh, North Vietnamese while they picked up the other four people. Unfortunately, he was sh uh, shot and killed. And uh, last year, I believe, he formally was given the Congressional Medal of Honor. So next slide. So bottom line here, this has been a tremendously successful way to do this. You know, you, you walk into a record center and you see rows and rows of boxes, and we worry all day long about archival principles, what, what kind of a record is it or is it, what's the schedule, how to handle it. But they're really important because they tell the story of your agency. Uh, you can work with other people to get uh, value from this. 
and I, I gotta tell you, the Presidential Libraries and the National Archives do a great job of this. And it's, uh, it's also important from a lessons learned standpoint. We have a Center for Studies of Intelligence, and one of their principal taskings is to uh, review what has gone on in the past and see what lessons can be uh, derived from it. They say if you, don't, uh, if you don't learn from your history, you're destined to relive it, and I believe there's truth in that. So at this point, are there any questions for us? We work closely with the Presidential Archives. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the ancillary photos that go along with these uh, weren't things that were CI records per se, but they're things that uh, in many cases we got from the Presidential Libraries because they have lots of contemporary information. They're also valuable in getting uh, guest speakers that are contemporaries to the event. Uh, it's one thing to have this event. It's another thing to have this event when you've got uh, like a, a person like General Singlob, who was in OSS during World War II, was in China watching the Chinese come in to uh, get ready to invade North Korea, but his opinion lost out to MacArthur's J-2, who said they couldn't possibly be coming because he was doing air reconnaissance flights during the day and the Chinese were moving their troops in at night. We're doing a big release on civil air transport next week in, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, uh, and we've already got a number of media interviews lined up, and we're told that there's going to be about 2,000 people in the audience. Uh, the next event after that is we're doing a release on Ronald Reagan's 100th birthday in uh, conjunction with the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, and they'll be instrumental in lining up members of Reagan's cabinet to actually speak at the event. Well, this has got to be the least number of questions I've ever had. Anybody else? Yeah? That Polish general, was he compensated for his services or did he do it for his own love of his country? He did it for love of his country. He became, it's Colonel Kuklinski. He became aware through the Soviet war plan that the plan was that the Soviets would, you know, there'd be this attack and a second wave of Soviet troops would come right through Poland uh, because Poland provides a nice geographic path into Europe. And so that he basically found out his country was going to be a doormat in the event of any major conflict. And that is to say the CIA did not pay him. The CIA may have paid him. We, you know, got him out of the country in that. But the money's of no consequence to, I mean, he put his, you know, he put his life out there. He put his family's life out there. Um, you know, if he'd been... There's a number of these people who've been caught, and it's a frankly a quiet shooting, and they drop off the radar screen. And it's this is why you don't often see human intelligence stories declassified, uh, because it, the outcomes can be so dramatically negative. And then what signs are you sending to other people that might elect to provide information to the U.S. government? No other questions. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Does the CIA have the same issues with disciplinary records patterns in your programs as the other agencies do? Well, one of the, we're placed strategically in CIO, and uh, we have the benefit, I guess, of the larger enterprise IT community. So, for example, in le electronic records, uh, it's very easy for us to get into the governance process to um, make sure that systems are not built without records management uh, built in up front and not on the back end. So from electronic records management perspective, it's easy. Plus we have a lot, when I compare us to other agencies, we have a lot more people doing this. I mean, I don't know many agencies that have a full-time professional records officer in each of their offices. So <clears throat> it's, it's a little bit simpler the way we're set up, but it's also a significant investment in, in uh, in time and people. Yes. Uh, we have a historical review panel, which is we talked about earlier, these academics, and they work with our historical collections division over what possible topics might be of interest. And then the first triage is to go through and see if we're going to be able to release a significant enough material related to that topic to be relevant. Like for, one of the examples, originally we had the idea of doing one large Cold War release and it was just too big and too unwieldy. So it's been broken down into a variety of smaller stories. So the Kuklinski story, which is Polish martial law, is one piece of that. The Czech invasion was another piece of that. And, but you really want to do some early triage about finding out whether you're going to be able to get enough records released 
because the sensitivity is attenuated to make it worthwhile. And if it looks like that's not going to fly, you're better off to make an early decision to move on to another topic. And ultimately, Dan and I decide, based on a lot of things that are presented to us, uh, what we're going to go forward with and, and uh, what will maybe wait till uh, its moment comes in the future. A lot of these projects are actually suggested by the records management folks in the components that actually touch and breathe these records. They say, hey, you know, it might be interesting to, uh, to, to look at this collection versus that collection. So. The National Clandestine Service, for example, was instrumental in the Kuklinski release. Uh, they're the ones that uh, arranged things I never thought I would see in my lifetime. Uh, not just having press at the CIA auditorium for, for this briefing, but actually having the Polish ambassador in, uh, live camera media from, uh, from Poland. Um, it was really an event to see. And some of these things come at a significant debate. You might be aware, and recently we released the oldest classified documents in narrow custody on secret writing and invisible ink. Well, that was, that was a civil war inside of CIA with the chemists to, to, to get to that point. But uh, um, we got there. Has a, um, some of the examples that you presented, um, from, my, from my first impression, they were textual records. And the focus, I thought, of this um, conference was on electronic records. Has CIA declassified any electronic records? And um, or are they at that path yet, where they're to develop their processes to review electronic records and actually release them and out in the public? We have the process to do that today, but most of the stuff that's electronic is still too young and too sensitive. To, OK. So I just wasn't sure like with your you know, systematic or MDR programs that you have actually identified some electronic records to declassify and release. That will come in probably in the not too distant future, I okay. would imagine. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? OK, please join me in thanking our guests.